Hello everyone and welcome back to Autobot Dawson Gaming. Today uh, it's my honor to be speaking with uh, an absolute legend in my opinion of the gaming industry. We have uh, Harvard trained award winning composer Peter McConnell, um, composer of the Sly Cooper soundtracks 2, 3, and 4. Uh, how you doing man? I'm doing great. Nice to be here. Awesome, awesome. Well, um, I will just jump right in. Um, I, I wanted to talk. I want to touch on, of course, you know, um, elements from each game. But um, as the viewers can actually see here on what I've chosen for the background, um, Sly Two in particular, um, which was my first, uh, my first Sly game. Actually, I sort of played them out of order as a kid. Um, but it, it's extremely memorable and nostalgic to me. So some of my early questions are definitely going to focus on Sly Two. Um, so, what was it like uh, collaborating um, with the game devs over at Sucker Punch on on the soundtrack for Sly Two? Uh, well, it was just great. Um, Sly Two is 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 a um, it's it's a, kind of a big deal for me as well because I had just uh, um, a, you know a couple years prior had had left um, Lucas Arts right and. Uh, and uh, I was uh, had kind of a lull. I was I was working on, on a, a game for Tim Schafer called Psychonauts, but but I had kind of a lull in the production, uh, and um, and uh, and being on my own, and, and also supporting a, um, a an internet startup. I was living in a little cottage in Berkeley, and I was doing an internet startup with my my friends Michael Land and Michael McMahon. Michael Mann, those two both being formerly of LucasArts, and Michael Land being the uh, former sound director um, at LucasArts. Anyway, we were doing this startup and, and pouring a lot of money into it, and, and uh, I was, uh, you know, uh, actively, it, my life was kind of backwards in that I was composing to support my uh, internet startup, which is, I, I really don't recommend. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, sort of like uh, it's sort of you, you know the joke about how, how you make a how you make a small fortune in, in the uh, wine business yes you start with a big one <laughs> right right <laughs> so anyway that's uh, anyway so uh, a friend of mine um, in from Seattle um, uh, Peter Chan who was a who was a um, uh, you know, wonderful artist for Lucas Arts, and you know we collaborated before. He mentioned that that um, the Sucker Punch team um, was uh, interested in a composer, and um, and uh, so it, thanks to Peter, I I was able to do a demo for them, and they sent me a VHS tape with uh, that's the way things went in those days with uh, Sly Coo with Sly up Sly Two, and was. Sly kind of creeping around in Paris, and my demo ended up being the Sly theme, the, from going from Sly two to Sly four. Wow. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I had a, uh, and and I played all the instruments. I played, little, I played the bongos. Uh, I played the guitar, the bass guitar, and then I had a little, and, and I had my friend Bill Ortiz play a little tiny uh, trumpet flourish on it. I think if I remember right. Um, and uh, so that was uh, that was uh, how it started. And uh, and my main person I worked with, with at Sucker Punch was uh, Dev Madden, who's an amazing um, amazing cartoonist. Um, he works, um, I think he works for Amazon these days. He's done a lot of interesting, and we've collaborated since then on, on uh, different titles. Um, and uh, so it was, uh, and and he really actually taught me a lot about um he's he's an artist but he taught me a lot about scoring um games um i mean i've been doing it for 10 years at lucas arts but um you know one of the things that uh that he really sort of taught me i guess uh, was was that you know some when you have cartoon music which is essentially sort of the genre we're, we're, we're in right when you have something that's a that's at the end of the day, it's lighthearted and funny. Um, it's and it's and this is especially true in the sly world. It's more funny and more lighthearted if the music is serious, uh, so that right. you're really 
So what you're scoring is is not the situation per se, but what the characters feel the situation is. You know, um, you know, Murray is is a is a funny character, but he's deadly serious about what he's doing uh, as a sly, and um, and, uh, and uh, so that's what Dev taught me was you know really get into the head of the characters and even if the situation might have some you know slapstick quality to it or 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 an absurdist quality to it um just stick with the character and uh and let the music be the straight man um and uh i think that's that's what i learned from from doing that first score (laughs) that is absolutely amazing man the fact that that demo became the main theme is incredible and actually segues right into what my next question was which was um it's it's an incredible thing you pulled off with the main theme because I specifically remember even playing it my first time, the way that you sort of mixed in like motifs from the theme into the other soundtracks um, through through the other tracks um, throughout the game, it made you nostalgic even if it was like your first time playing it. So now after going back and playing through it all these years later. Um, it, that hits even harder. So, what was uh, what was the idea behind sort of mixing in the main theme into some of the the areas as well? Well, um, you know, I, I think <laughs> that, that that goes back to sort of um, the nineteenth century, and uh, not that I was around then, although I practically was. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, it goes to the to, to um, Wagner and um, and uh, people before him, Carl Maria von Weber, uh, German composer. Um, the idea of a light motif. And the light motif is a um, is uh, it's a little bit different from a theme. Um, uh, and uh, Wagner's Wagner's idea, of sort of how to how to create a unified work, was that the music should constantly be communicating. Um, through through melodies what is significant about the moment right and uh so in in the ring cycle there is a sword theme you know the 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 sword actually has a theme and uh and of course each character has a theme and and and, uh there's sort of and there's sort of themes of like the valkyries and so on but i mean themes aren't new but the way wagner used them was was very specifically these little tiny nuggets, right? Like the sword theme is very simple. It's like bum 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 bum, bum something like that. I don't quite have it right, but um, it's not unlike the Force theme in Star Wars, where there's a there's a whole theme and there's a whole uh, phrase. I'm sorry, uh, in, in the uh, Force theme, and and uh, which which you know John Williams is going right back to the Spagnerian tradition, where where you have the entire force theme is bum 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 ba da bum 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 ba 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 right right ba bum ba 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 I'm sorry and um and uh, but you don't always get and that happens the full theme will happen at a big moment a big it right but sometimes um you'll just do the the first part of it right just a hint of it when it's like it's when the force is being used. And um, right now, I can't recall a, 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 a an exact moment. Um, I think in New Hope, he don't play. He doesn't play the whole theme when he's just about when when uh, when he's in the doing the trench run. Uh, and Obi Wan's voice comes in. Point is that um, this is this idea of using Wagnerian uh, light motif is it's baked into film because all of the film composers in the 20th century were great admirers of the operatic works of the 19th century and before because opera was the sort of um it was the it was the artwork that was the precursor to film that's you know live actors on a stage with music right and uh, so it, it just would only make sense that that you would you would draw on, on um, operatic traditions when you're scoring, say, The Big Sleep or um, or um, Key Largo, which I just watched last night with my family. Um, uh, 
so and that's a so we in games inherited the film tradition which is inherited from opera so now getting that's a really long-winded answer to your question right but but um if you go back to uh sly <laughs> and this little um dun, 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 right uh, all you have to do is that much and you know you're you're talking about sly right right uh, and and that's so it's a little gist it's a little moment where it's like if it's sly's moment you're going to hear that little that little motif um and, and all you have to hear is the bum, 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 bum. you don't have to hear the whole bum, 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 bum. right so really that the saving the full theme only for really really significant moments like you know a big turn in the usually pretty much the end of the game um so it's like a title piece right but little fragments of it will play just as just to remind you who who who's important in the moment and also to bind the whole score together thematically so that i mean you don't want to just write a bunch of man random melodies first of all it's hard to write good melodies so you, you you just want to pick a few and then stick with them and secondly if they are good you want to hear them over and over again anyway so um it's it, it all fits together into a, a kind of a picture where where um you, you know uh, the the game the vibe of the game what moment you're in it's all sort of wrapped up in in those little fragments that keep coming back and it makes the music more fun to write more fun to play more fun to listen to and you know just better art because it um if i can use the term um because it uh it adds some depth, right? To, it's not just, you don't just have action music, you have action music that happens to have, you know, Dr. M's music in it, right? Right, exactly. So, well, that, yeah. I, I love that, man. It, that Definitely the cohesion that you're talking about comes through crystal clear. Um, you know, it's it's part of what makes the game so iconic is is those, uh, those cohesive soundtracks. And speaking of that... Um, so Dimitri's nightclub, which of course is like one of the first areas we we head to in Sly Two, um, it's such an electric and catchy track that I think has stuck with more than just me. I think a lot of people uh, remember that one and still talk about that one today. Um, it just felt like um, it, it captured the uh, the feel of of the nightclub and of Dimitri perfectly. I mean, I remember like even um, there's like a mission where. You, you sort of sneak in through the window and uh, there's like the janitor rats and and uh, they won't even attack you if you don't attack them. So I remember like sitting there um, do it during that platforming section and just like staying in that room literally for like an hour as a kid just like because I didn't want to stop listening to the, to the track. Uh, so what can you tell me That's about it. that Dimitri track, man, or that nightclub? Um, you know, what, what all did you know? Uh, about the character going into composing that track and, and what was sort of the process and were you happy with the outcome? Well, Dimitri is kind of a, um, he, he's a, uh, at least I saw him uh, as somewhat of a parody of the sort of New York disco owner of the 70s, right? Um, with his little gold chain and so on. And um, and so I, you know, I I, I <laughs> I'll, I'll just say it. I was born in 1960, so uh, I remember a lot of stuff from a long time ago. <laughs> and um, and uh, unfortunately for me, I, so, so I, I, fortunately for me, my introduction to pop music after coming back from Europe um, to live in uh, the U.S. Um, uh, my dad studied theology in uh, in uh, Switzerland, and that's those are my earliest memories. And then we came to uh, Kentucky, Eastern Kentucky, and. Uh, so, but, but uh, fortunately for me, uh, we came to Kentucky the same year the Beatles um, came to the U.S. And my introduction to pop music was really some of the coolest pop music that's been, which is the music from roughly 1964 to roughly 1974. Um, and, but, unfor- but unfortunately for me, when I, by the time I was in high school, it was the 70s. <laughs> right. And I got to, I just, I just, I, I just, 
I wish it I wish it hadn't been this way now um, but I just could not stand disco I mean I just hated it in the 70s and it took me it took me years um, and part of it was from doing parodies of disco <clears throat> it took me years to actually go back and listen to that music and go my god those bands were good jeez I mean like oh uh a song like Boogie Nights is just um, I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on the name of the band but it's just like those players are so they're in such a righteous groove and, and it just um, it's just something I, I failed to appreciate at the time because it was because it was eclipsing my beloved rock and roll right <laughs> but um, but uh, but honestly I mean that's some of the best you know the disco era had such great bands and um so for me doing something like like dimitri's music was like well i make i'm making fun of something that um that uh you know is uh, that i didn't like in high school (laughs) but uh you know being older and wiser i'm also kind of sending a love letter to that whole era because there was like i say it's just some fantastic music and and what I, I mean, really, what I've learned um, for for myself is is that I really there's very little music that there is in the world that I don't like. Uh, and you know, my, <laughs> the thing I, I usually say is is well, a lot of people say they like all kinds of music, and what they really mean is everything from Led Zeppelin to ACDC. <clears throat> um, and uh, honestly, I really do like pretty much all kinds of music and there's bad music in pretty much every genre if you're a classical music fan i i really uh, urge you not to listen to a guy named carl ditters von ditterstorf Um, what a name and uh yeah (laughs) and uh you know but there's there there's red you know reggae is one of my favorite kinds of music but there's certain kinds of dub reggae that i i would really uh, i don't know if i could um I don't know if I could survive listening to more than five minutes of it. Um, uh, you know, and it's just like, the list goes on. There's a, there's a my, my roommate in, uh, in, uh, in college, well, when we were living off campus, a housemate, I guess you'd say, um, he had a little sign on his door that said, the trouble with good jazz is that there isn't enough of it. Um, you know, basically, you can mess anything up, and and then certain kinds of music, uh, and I think disco was one of them. Will get, will just, you know, get haters. Um, but um, what I've learned is that just pretty much, uh, you know, every kind of music has some kind of virtuoso element, some kind of really something that's really worth listening to. So I I literally try to listen to absolutely everything. I can. Absolutely. Well, I mean, that that's definitely a good way to be. I'm trying to become more eclectic myself. Uh, when I was younger, I was basically just a metal fan. And then I discovered, like, progressive... Oh, I discovered, like... Pro- I was talking about. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. What'd you say? <laughs> no, metal is awesome. Now, there's another one I came to late, right? Uh, and that, and boy, what a, what a, just amazing, uh, what an amazing, uh, it's like the classical music of rock and roll metal is. That's what I've said. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, <laughs> that's great you that know, you feel because, that way. Because the, you know, you know, you know it's, it, because it, it takes to play it well, it takes such incredible chops and incredible sort of a musical knowledge to really actually play metal um, uh, the way it should be played. Uh and uh, you know, and the people who, who pioneered it were really coming from. Uh, and there's also a folk tradition they were tapping into, like a Celtic folk, folk tradition. Uh, at least that's what I hear when I hear bands like Judas Priest and uh, and uh, Black Sabbath. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it, there's a, there's another example of a genre where where you know I was not into it in high school. Um, although that kind of I, I think I was selectively into some of them. But, but basically it took me a while to realize wait a minute you know this is really um, this has really got some stuff going on 
Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, like once I got into like the more progressive side of it, I started that ended up showing me like folk music and all kinds of different things. So I'm trying to to be more eclectic myself. Um, so, and then the the reason I have this question positioned right after the Dimitri one is honestly to compliment the like insane variety that you've managed to work into this soundtrack beautifully. Um, which it goes hand in hand with what we're talking about with different genres right here, because I then one of the other pieces that really stuck with me was in uh, the He Who Tames the Iron Horse, the the Canada level um, episode six. It's like this rustic acoustic guitar uh, driven composition um, that just is like a complete um, contrast to the Dimitri soundtrack and matches the the you know the Canada area, the snowy sort of peaceful country setting um, just as well as Dimitri's disco theme matches the bustling Paris setting it. So what was your approach to sort of peel back the layers and do that? like nice warm rustic track for for that part well um so that's that's definitely the canada music thanks for that by the way that's actually my favorite sly music period is is that canada music oh Um, really uh just from a just from a vibe yeah um uh i mean well I mean, all, all my music's my favorite music, and the, the stuff I did uh, in, in Nashville uh, for Sly Four is, is I, I still really like that a lot, um, uh, and um, I think it's some of my best stuff. But but just sort of as as, as kind of a well, how would I say it, kind of a um, uh, sentimental or personal level that music because um, I'm. I, I really, I was classically trained on the violin, and um, in high school I started picking up other instruments, and specifically five-string banjo. Um, um, excuse the long, uh, what's about to be a long departure here. Um, and uh, it, it was uh, because the movie Deliverance had just come out, and I thought banjos were cool. And also, when I was a little kid in Kentucky, um, uh, you could you could turn on the TV and you could get about two stations in Eastern Kentucky in those days. And one of them was a West Virginia station that had a half hour show with flat and scrubs on it. Um, and, um, I assume you know who flat and scrubs are, right? I, I honestly don't, but it does sound familiar to me. Oh, I, I, I'm ashamed as a fellow Let Kentuckian. I'm ashamed. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 uh, Earl Scruggs basically, invented um a style on on the five string banjo that's probably what everybody thinks of as bluegrass these days okay he and uh, so and he kind of rocketed to fame if you will with the movie bonnie and clyde which would had the had um faye dunaway and and um i don't know i can't remember the act the actor but anyway it was a it was um uh it was about the 30s and, and bluegrass is a music that grew up in the 30s trust me we're going to get to Canada we're going to get there oh um, I believe you <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and so so anyway the, 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 and, and I just thought the, from those experiences of watching uh, the bluegrass show on uh, on uh, you know when I was a little kid and then learning the five string banjo I got really into folk music of, of, of American folk music and, and British Isles folk music, um, and I uh, learned a lot about um, a lot from a, a fellow in uh, uh, my extended family has a, some cabins in Connecticut, and in that neighborhood, there's a uh, there's a uh, a folk musician named Guy Wolf, who's a who's a uh, potter by trade. Um, and he's an amazing folk musician. He's who was a friend of Pete Seeger's. Um, Anyway, um, he played banjo and guitar, and I learned a bunch of stuff from him as well. Um, and uh, so, and, and I think uh, what I really like about folk music is its connection to nature. It, it, at least for me, it has a connection to nature. It comes from a time, uh, a, a lot of the uh, well-known folk songs or, or the traditional folk songs come from a time when, when people were closer to the land. Um, and uh, 
And for me specifically, I've always loved going camping and fishing. And there's a tradition in my family that goes back to literally the 1840s or something of fishing in Canada. Uh, and uh, uh, the so for me, music that is about the wilds and specifically about Canada it has something special to it. And I'll add to that mix a, uh, a Canadian artist named Bruce Coburn, spelled C-O-C-K-B-U-R-N. Uh, and he's an amazing songwriter, and uh, he's Canadian. Uh, and his, his guitar style pretty much, um, it will very heavily influence the way I play guitar. Uh, so you kind of wrap all that up into all those influences up into uh, one sort of big influence. And I get to write music for, for um, you know, this, this Canada train station, uh, which I wanted to suggest snow, I wanted to su- suggest the wild. There's a slide guitar in it, which is, which is a, it's, a, it's an old Gibson guitar that I, that I, um, uh, it's a, that I uh, bought when I was a, like 18 and uh, I still use it for um, I still use it for most of my recording and that's uh, amazing that and and the, the slide you know why a slide guitar that comes from the that comes from the Mississippi Delta blues tradition uh, so pretty far south from Canada um, uh, but somehow it seemed to make sense um, I mean I suppose if you want to get technical about it the French from Mississippi moved up into Acadia. Um, but uh, I think that would just be me BSing for why, why I came up with a slide guitar. But that, does that answer your question? I, 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 it, to, I guess the short answer is I love nature. I actually live in a place that's pretty close to nature. And um, a lot of the music that I've loved in my life from classical music to uh, to different kinds of folk music, I somehow I find to be connected to nature. So that that uh, train station music comes from that. And there's also now I think of it, there's a fair amount of classical um, influence there too, because there's that piano part, right, and the flute, which is pretty out there. And um, I mean, the very first music that I listened to uh, when I was a kid that I remember hearing was Mozart in, in Basel, Switzerland. Um, and so I got this European tradition too. So, I, oh, yeah, it a hundred. You know what I would say is, is oh, go ahead. Oh no, I was gonna. Uh, been going on for, no, you're good. I, I was, I was gonna say like you, yeah, that a hundred percent. Like what you were saying earlier, a hundred percent answers a question. But please go ahead. We, we are here to hear your thoughts. I was, I was gonna say, you know, when you, if you're gonna write music or really do any art. I think being in touch with your own experiences because there's only one of you, right? And uh, I was lucky enough to, um, to well, lucky in some ways, uh, you'd say, to live in a lot of places as a kid. So I lived in in, uh, in Switzerland and Kentucky and Kansas and New Jersey and then uh, a lot of years in Boston and then a whole ton of years out here in California. And... Uh, uh, so, and all those, all those, there was different music in every one of those places. And, um, uh, but that's just sort of an obvious example. Though my point is that you know, there's only one of you, right? Artist. Um, and, uh, and so if you really tap into those things, which are, which you've experienced, which are unique, you're going to you're going to come up with something hopefully that, that, that you like and that other people like, and that is, uh, not something someone else can do because they didn't have your experience. Oh, that absolutely makes sense. That's a definitely a beautiful way of putting it. I think personal experience is like essential to any, any form of art for sure. Um, and that's, that's amazing. Um, that, you know, you had that many thoughts on the, uh, the Canada piece because that is one that's definitely stuck with me. So, uh, you know, bravo on that. Um, real quick, uh, slight departure. By the way, you did, you, 
Did you hear the slide theme in the Canada piece? Oh, yes. That was actually the one I was thinking of when I wrote that first question. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, that, that, that was the other fun thing about that was like, okay, how am I, how how I going to put this sort of like slinky jazz theme um, and make it into, you know, like Ry Cooter? You know, how am I going to do that? And that was fun. A, a fun thing to come up with anyway go ahead no absolutely i it, it, and it was that like it, it really was that first example for me because i was, you hear it and it's just oh man hearing that sort of heist heisty type music that sly's theme is and then mixed with the <laughs> the acoustic it's just so cool um all right so moving on from there this is a sort of a well actually something you mentioned a minute ago that i didn't have written down that i want to ask you about um you said that you recorded um thieves in time in nashville is that right that's correct yes awesome so how was it coming back to uh to the series for thieves in time after what i remember to be quite a quite a long time in between three and four if i remember right yeah there's a there, yeah there was well yeah and uh during that Time, I think part of the reason for that is that Sucker Punch shifted their, um, their, um, you know, they shifted their focus to other titles, right? Um, which made sense for them. And, and Dev, uh, who had created the, the characters, um, uh, left Sucker Punch to do other things. Um, so the, so Sly was sort of, you know, as a as a as a sort of a series was kind of in limbo for a while, I guess you'd say. And, um, but um, in uh, yeah, I'm trying to remember when we started that. I, I believe it got released in 2012, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, it was 12 or 13 but, uh, for sure on when it got released. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I think we were still. I think our second our. I believe our second set of, of uh, sessions might have been in 2012. Um, that would make sense. Um, so yeah. Uh, okay. Anyway, what was it like? Well, it was nice to return to it actually because um, because uh, the, with Sly Four, Sony put you know notable resources into the uh, into the game that that. Uh, I didn't have available to me uh, in, in uh, slide two and three. So for slide two and three, I was uh, I'm, for slide three. Uh, well, everything was recorded at my little cottage in Berkeley, and okay. uh, uh, <laughs> including the drums. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, I definitely, <laughs> I, it was definitely to the chagrin of my neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> I guarantee it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, one guy came over. Um, one guy came over and really kind of let me have it. And uh, you know, later on, I, I I gave him a free copy of the game, but I don't think that really helped that much. <laughs> he should have been honored. He um, didn't know what he was missing out on. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, so it was done. You know, it was done on a, a lower budget. I, I was able to work with some great musicians because we have some wonderful musicians in the Bay Area that, and uh, that I got to know working on Grim Fandango with. Uh, uh, Lucas Arts at uh, Lucas Arts, um, uh, people like Bill Ortiz, who is who is um, who is a, a Santana's trumpet player, and, and um, a guy named Carl von Bodding on on drums, who's no longer with us. Um, just just some amazing um, uh, Sheldon Brown on on. Uh, um, I just want to say these people's names you know, that, because they're just such amazing. Um, Sheldon Brown on on reeds. Uh, they're just such amazing players, and I, really, one of the best things about my job is working with um, world-class musicians, being instrumental musician. Uh, I, I'm just lucky enough to write notes that, that world-class musicians will actually play, and uh, and uh, so for Sly Four, um, we were able to do re- record two over two hours of music um, and uh, two sets of two week long sets of sessions in Nashville and uh, uh, and conducted by uh, amazing conductor from LA uh, uh, and uh, his name's Tim Davies I, I think it's okay for me to give his name 
Um, and, uh, um, just, the, you know, this roster of players, um, uh, that are just, uh, fantastic. For example, um, uh, a guy named Jeff Coffin who plays, um, leads for Dave Matthews. Um, Jeff is, I, I've worked with him a number of times since then. brief technical error you guys we're having to extend the time on our meeting uh, because zoom is uh, dumb and likes to be limited so let me just get that back in real quick I'm messaging Peter right now. Sorry about this, you guys. Uh, this unexpected uh, little computer glitch here. I'm sure he'll be right back in. Zoom actually, uh, they gave me the option to upgrade, but when I did, it, it closed the meeting and I had to upgrade in order to extend the time. Yep, he is on his way back. Little Sly Cooper waiting room music for you. Hello, sorry about that, man. I apparently oh, zoomed, no Zoom timed me out, so I just put on. Uh, <laughs> get on, get for running on at the mouth. No, you're good. I just put on uh, some of the soundtrack in the background while we were waiting, so it was fine. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I don't know where, where, what the last thing you heard me say was. Yes, uh, the last thing I heard you talking about was um, you were talking about how obviously you were recording in Nashville. Um, you listed the names of some very talented people. You talked about the conductor that you worked with, um, and I think that was sort of where we where we landed. You talked about how you had a bigger budget as well. Yeah, yeah. Did I did I mention Jeff Koff and the replayer? Mm, yes, yes, you did. Yeah, he's fantastic. I just uh, he was he got nominated for Grammy actually uh, this year. Oh, that's amazing. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, no, it just it, it just um, these these. Uh, you know, the players, we're very lucky, you know, to have players like this to work with. And, and, uh, and, and uh, lucky in the U.S. because we've got this jazz tradition that's so powerful in it. And, and I, love, um, I love jazz and classical music as well as rock and roll. So being able to work with people who are really steeped in, in those traditions is, is something that uh, is just a real, uh, a real joy for me. Um, so yeah, the, in, in Nashville, we, you know, we stayed there for, we had two sessions and there was, a uh, uh, you know, a team from Sony there. Um, my good friend Clint Bajakian from, <clears throat> from, uh, LucasArts, uh, days was one of them and Chuck Dow, the audio director was there. Um, and, um, several, uh, Jonathan, anyway, a bunch of folks were there really uh, fantastic engineers uh, from Sony. They have just a crack audio team. And uh, so we were able to record um, a small orchestra um, in, a, in a, a place called Ocean Way Studios in, in Nashville. And uh, a number of sort of reed and brass players in different groups as well. Uh, and it was just super, super fun. Well, really one of the best um, 
uh, sort of recording experiences I've had, um, and I've got I've gotten to work. I still work. Um, uh, I still work with uh, Nashville folks uh, to this day, uh, along with other places. Awesome, man. That's good to hear. And I think Thieves in Time did have a absolutely stellar soundtrack as well. Um, so. You know, if, if you're an older fan of the series and you haven't checked out Thieves in Time because maybe you um, were getting older at that time or you fell out of it, trust me, it, it holds up just like the others, in my opinion. Go check it out. Um, and from there, I have three final questions for you. Um, sure. So one of them um, is... So when I originally wrote this question, it was before the Mario movie came out. Now that the Mario movies came out, it sort of changed it a little bit. Um, with the like wild success of that, I think everybody in the gaming community is kind of thinking like, okay, this is probably going to, you know, we had the superhero craze. We're probably going to have the video game craze at this point. Um, and seeing as like, Sly was it almost got a movie. Uh, you know, we had a trailer, a teaser trailer, and everything before it was canceled. Um, do you think, like, um, you know, do you think there's ever a chance we could ever see Sly in movie? And more importantly, if we did, um, you know, it would be a shame if they got anyone other than you to do the soundtrack. Would you do the soundtrack for a Sly Cooper movie? I agree with you. It would be a shame. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it would. Um, um, I, 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 you know, I, 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 I certainly haven't heard anything about it. Um, I think uh, I was, you know, uh, it, it seems to me that that uh, uh, you know they, they they didn't do anything for the twentieth anniversary of Sly, so uh, who knows what what um, what Sony's plans are, and you know, making any kind of a uh, you know. Uh, that investing serious resources into into a, a property is, you know, it's 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 a big decision that the companies make, and um, and there's so many factors besides the fact that they want to do it right. Uh, there, you know, can they find the right developer? Um, uh, do they think that what do, do they think that the, that there's enough people who actually play the game? Um, or go see the movie for whatever reasons, and then also what what other things do they have on their docket that they need to put their resources into? You know, so I I don't have I'm a big boy and I don't I don't like get mad because some company decides not to do something that I wish they would do. You know, it's it's a it's a tough world out there. Um, so you know, I, the answer to your question is I don't know. Um, Obviously, if I did, I wouldn't be able to say anyway, um, you know, until and unless they would announce. Oh, right. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but, but uh, uh, you know, I, I think, um, yeah, I, am. I mean, I sure hope that, um, I sure hope that they do more movies based on games. I mean, they've done, they have done Uncharted. That's another one. I just watched that last night, actually. Um and uh and the super mario movie and there's and and there's probably going to be more um and it is i will say uh sometimes when they decide to do uh something in hollywood they'll use different uh a, a different roster of people than they used for the game uh so uh it's you know for, for whatever reasons you know it's people they're used to working with um but um uh, if I had the opportunity to score uh, a Sly movie, I think I would do a hell of a good job. So. Oh yeah, absolutely. And listen, if if in this if in this dream scenario the movie ever did happen, or for that matter, a Sly Five game happened, and for some idiotic reason they were thinking about using someone other than you, using someone other than Kevin Miller for Sly Cooper's voice, anything like that, you know, the community is definitely going to riot about it. So. They'll they'll probably end up changing yeah, their minds. <laughs> and and yeah, that's it. you know that's that, I think it's great that the uh, you know fans get involved like that. So uh, uh, yeah, well, like I said, who knows? Um, and uh, I I just uh, I I do hope they do in general. I hope they do more movies based on games though, because uh, I think it is. I think you're right. That it's it's a it's part of people's experience that um, 
I mean, the, w- one thing that's different about a game uh, from other types of entertainment is the amount of time you spend on it. And so, you know, I probably one of the most satisfying things about my job, right, is, is that I'll get some uh, email from, from somebody who's like, you know, I played these games, you know, with my dad or whatever uh, when, you know, growing up. And it's, and it's just this fond part of my childhood. And, you know, and the reason for that is, is that uh, they spent so much time on it and, and the, all the work that went into that game, uh, including the music, uh, really translated in some into hopefully into someone's positive experience, right? And so there are a lot of folks like that who, who grew up with games. Who, who um, for them, it's like uh, it's like a friend, an old friend. You know, Sly, Sly's like an old friend for people who played Sly. Oh yes. And, uh, so I, I think uh, that is a that right there is a reason to to turn it into a movie because. Uh, 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 or any game that, that that people are you know really grew up with because uh, because it taps into their experience and you know that's that's what you want to do when you're making a, when you're making a film. You, you were talking about memories, uh, you know, of uh, like you love it when when uh, when people have great stories about playing the game with their dad or you know anything like that. You'll you'll like this. Um, honest to God, my my dad's actually he's completely blind at this point in his life and. Uh, um, he has a, like a rare eye disease, but anyway, I, I won't get into all that right now, but basically the, the point is, um, despite that, he would still sit there on the couch, uh, with me when I played games, um, whether it be Sly, Zelda, all kinds of different things that I loved. Sly was a huge one for me. And he, um, he's the one who got me into music as well. And I kid you not, I mean, he actually always pointed out when we were playing Sly, like, Oh, we're playing Sly. Like you know, I can tell from the soundtrack. He loves the Sly soundtrack, and um, you oh, know, that's beautiful. yeah. So it, it it you know it 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 resonated with him enough to be able to identify like what game I was playing without me even having to uh, you know explain to him what was going on. And uh, so it it's great memories for me too. Um, you know, the, you just can't replace you just can't replace those those early experiences. It's just. Uh, you know, and and it holds up today a hundred percent. I mean, I would en- I enjoy this game as an adult. I enjoy the series as an adult just as much um, as I as I do as a kid. Well, well, thank you for that. Thank you for that story. I, 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 that really is, like I say, it's the best thing for me is to is to know that I've you know been a part of someone's life like that. And, uh, and anyway, thank you. <laughs> yeah, no problem, man. And that that brings me to my last uh, sort of it's. Uh, probably as much of a statement as it is a question, but uh, my my uh, my my closing comment here. Um, you know, I was looking through. I wanted to make sure that I had all my homework in line and everything before uh, getting the chance to talk to you. And um, I noticed that um, among a lot of different awards, there was a huge amount on there. Um, stuff for Psychonauts and Sly and all kinds of different projects you've been a part of. Um, but you won the 2005 Game Audio Network Guild Award um, for Best Interactive Score for Sly 2. Um, again, at one of just a huge list of, of awards. And I'm sure that that is um, really awesome and, and m- you know, meaningful to you. But um, more so than that, you know, at the end of the day, with all the awards, all the accolades and everything, what do you actually want your legacy to be? Like, what do you want your... Um, you know, mark on music and the gaming industry to be, um, you know, looking back? Um, well, well, that's a great question. Um, I think on one level, on sort of a, a uh, artist level, I, I'd like to be thought of someone who put, a, you know, maybe a little more depth into, into, a piece of music than 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 uh, one might normally expect, because um, I do take uh, what I do really seriously. Uh, no, no matter what I'm, you know, no matter what I'm scoring, uh, and uh, and uh, when I'm lucky to have something like like Sly, it's all the better because because uh, 
it, it inspires me to, uh, you know, to, to, to do a good job. Um, I think so on an artistic level, um, that's one thing I'd like to be known for. But I think the, the, the most important thing goes back to what we were just talking about, which is just touching people's lives. Like if I, if, if my, if my music in some little way, uh, you know, it, it, it made, made people a little happier. Um, that's really, uh, that's the best thing. And all, all of my really best experiences of, of just sort of, you know, what, uh, uh, how can you say it? Uh, moments of job satisfaction <laughs> are, are um, when someone was actually touched by the music. Absolutely. I, well, that's a great answer, man. And I, I, you know, I certainly think you'll be remembered for those things. Uh, everyone, this has been Peter McConnell, uh, an absolute legend of the gaming industry. And seriously, if at this point uh, you've stumbled upon this video and you haven't played the Sly Cooper series or listened to the Sly Cooper soundtrack, go do that. Um, these games are absolute uh, gems. You will not regret playing them. And I think that the soundtrack is totally legendary. It, in my honest opinion, it, it holds up there with the very best. I mean, it literally gives like the Ocarina of Time uh, soundtrack a run for its money. And I think those are, you know, I, I speak of the the Sly Cooper soundtrack and the Ocarina of Time soundtrack is like two of the very best, um, you know, gaming soundtracks anywhere. So a job well done from you, sir. And uh, you definitely deserve uh, the career you've had and more. So thank you so much for uh, just taking the time to talk to me. Seriously, childhood dream come true. Thank you, Dawson. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me.